Um, I guess I'll start. Uh, three small housekeeping matters. One, congratulations on finding this room. We'll hopefully be here on, for the rest of the course. Um, I'm glad you're all the seats now. Second, if you care about problem sets, there's someone, there's one online. Um, all we really care about there is a serious attempt, or seeing a serious attempt to learn. So, I don't know, hopefully have fun, don't stress too much. If you get excited by some problem and just want to write a lot about that problem, a few of them are fairly open-ended. Feel free just to, to write about something you're interested in, rather than trying to be complete. Uh, and lastly, the video seems to have sort of worked from last time, so if it's on the internet, it's on YouTube, and you can find it at the link to on the course web page. Okay, uh, so let's begin. Um, so, yesterday we saw in the end this, this definition of a pre-order. So let me remind you what this is. Um, a pre-order, which is a set and a relation, so it is a, it is a set P, a relation, less than a subset of P times P, and then uh, such that one, um, right in this relation infix, we say x is less than x, so xx is in, P in this relation, and two, such that if xy is in the relation, that is, we say x is less than y, and y is less than z, than Z. Is this large enough for everyone to read in the back? Cool. Am I loud enough? Great. Um, okay, so why do we care about this structure? First, uh, we saw a bunch of interesting examples yesterday, and we'll see more in the next half hour. But second, uh, this is a course on applied category theory, and a pre-order happens to be one of the elementary examples, or an elementary class of, of categories. Well, pre order happens to be an elementary category. So, so much of when you're exploring concepts in category theory, one thing that, that's often very sort of I don't know, illuminating to do is explore the implications for that concept inside the, the setting of pre orders. And so that's part of what we'll do throughout this lecture. Um, this condition is often called reflexivity, to it. Um, and this is often called transitivity. But they're shadows of, of other categorical notions. So just a quick show of hands, who has, in applied category theory course, who has seen the notion of category before? Um, who is, who would be comfortable writing the definition of the board right now? And who has never heard of it before? Okay, so that's great. Um, it's a great audience. We'll, for, for those of you who haven't seen it before, just take away that this notion is, this is a sort of category. Um, so we're already inside category theory. For those that have seen the definition before and are familiar with it, you may want to think of, uh, say, say, two more precise statements than that. First is, uh, a pre-order is a category uh, without most modern morphism between any two objects. So that should be easy to explore if you have the definition. Something slightly more complicated is that a pre-order is a pool-enriched category. So that's just something for people to think about if this is review to them. Um, everyone should understand those statements next week. Okay, so 
The other interesting definition we saw yesterday uh, was that of, of meat enjoying. So, let me figure out what location I want. Um, so, if we have a, a pre order P and we have some subset of elements in that pre order, then uh, we say that some element of that pre order P is a meet of A if um, for all A and A, P is S and A. So that is that um, P is a lower bound for it. P is a lower bound, and meat is also a, a greater slower bound. So that, that means that for all um, Q and P such that Q is also a lower bound of A, right? so such that for all A and A, Q is less than A, we have that Q is less than P. So P is lower bound. So the notation we saw yesterday was um, this sort of horn symbol. So we write P is equal to, could say the meat of A, it could also be sort of the meat of A such that A is in A, or yesterday we saw a notation like this where, where these A1 to AN are the elements of A. Um, this is not to say that A is finite, but in the finite case, we'll sort of, we might write this. And in particular, in the case that A has two elements, we write, let's call them A and B, then we'll write A meet B. Okay. Um, similarly, A join is, this is a great as well bound, um, is A least upper bound. So it's the same idea, but you reverse all the inequalities. Okay. Let's see some examples then. So a very elementary poset set is this poset set O, which is the same ball that appears in that statement over there. So I'm going to write sets using this convention called a, a Hasse diagram. Um, but in particular, what it is, it's a bunch of points, which I'm going to write here as T and F, or true and false, and then there's arrow, an arrow between them indicating the order. So this is the, the, the pre-order, uh, which has the set. The set P is T, F, so, and it has the order that F is less than true, but also for it to be a poset, you need to, to close under, sorry, a pre-order, a poset is a, another similar word, um, and I'll use it basically as the same word in this course. Um, you need to close under these, these two statements. So in particular, true is less than true and false is less than false. Okay, so what are, let's compute just binary meets in this poset. So, So what would true meet true be? Um, it's the what? It's the, the greatest lower bound. Um, so it's an element in, in the poset that's both less true, both less than true and less than true, and greater than anything else that is less than both those things. So what does that mean? Any ideas? Yeah, it's true. That's what I've talked about before. It's used to end up saying true or not. Um, similarly, the argument false is very similar. Um, the greatest lower bound of, of false and false is again false. And if you have true and false, the greatest lower bound is has to be less than both true and false, so it has to be false. And, and false is, in fact, the only lower bound. 
So we have this, this table here for binary or pairwise meets. Um, so you might notice, uh, if you've done some elementary logic, that this is the truth table for and. Okay. Similarly, if we do a similar computation for binary join, um, the same sorts of argument for the truth table is this, which means the truth table is or. Okay. So these notions of and and all just arise from the analysis of this simple post set here with two elements where one is greater than the other, and these notions of least upper bound and greatest lower bound. Okay, so that's one example. Um, I'm gonna run through a bunch more examples and we'll see some familiar notions. So, second, let's talk about power sets. So, to every set x, you can associate the, um, the set of subsets of x and inclusion ordering. So what is a subset of x? Let's, let's pick a particular set. Um, we're going to pick the set square times my face. Right. So given the set, what is a subset? Well, it's any collection of things in here. Okay. So there's the collection that has everything in there. There's the collection of nothing in there, which I'm going to write with this empty set symbol, but you also might write with sort of brackets with nothing in between. Um, and then you have all the sorts of pairs. Uh, so box times, box, box smiley face, times smiley face, and then the individual ones. Face. And so to complete this diagram, these are the elements of this, this power set of, of this set. And inclusion, this, this subset or inclusion ordering, says that we have an arrow from one to the other when this one set is contained in another. So box is contained in box times, so there's an arrow there. It's also contained there, similarly. These arrows. Um, the empty set is contained in everything. And every, this set contains everything. So you'll notice they haven't drawn, for example, the arrow from box to everything, but that's sort of implicit in the fact that there's a path and this notion here of transitivity. Okay, so we have another post set, and I want to think about what I meet and join in the setting. So, it turns out that um, meet is equal to intersection. So let's think about this. Say if I have this set and this set, what's a, what's a lower bound of this set? It's anything that's contained in the both, so it's anything below um, <coughs> both these two things. So it could be this or it could be the empty set that's contained in both of these things. Um, but it's the greatest lower bound. So smiley face is the greatest lower bound. And you see that smiley face is the, the common element, the intersection between box smiley face and tight smiley face. Similarly, join is union. Um, that is, the, the smaller set containing, both, containing two sets is just the union of those two sets. Um, so it's fairly straightforward to see, but again we see familiar notions coming out of this, this notion of pre-order and out of uh, these, these constructions join and meet. Uh, we saw, um, moving more quickly now, yesterday we had this idea of the first set of subjections or partitions, um, and we saw this example here. <coughs> where we had so four people who were interested in this idea of contagion between these people. So there's a mom and a kid, a co-worker of the mom, and a friend of the kid. Um, and we have these partitions, this is partition one, which is sort of day, the day. This is partition two, which 
equation 2, which is what happens at night, and the join is sort of the coarsest thing, that, or finest thing that can, uh, is coarser than them both. numbers with the usual ordering, so the usual ordering says that 1 is less than 2 is less than 3, so this differs from the previous example, so that it's infinite, um, and here, what do we have? We have meets, uh, the minimum, so if we take a subset of this and ask for its meet, it's the minimum element of that subset, and the join will be the max. Fifth example, uh, uses the same set, we're allowed to use the same set when we talk about uh, free orders, but we could put a different ordering, and I'll call this the division ordering, which says that um, so let's say, we'll say A is less than B if A divides B in it, sort of cleanly, as, as usual for natural numbers. So what does this mean? Uh, the pre-order looks something like this. 1 is at the bottom, because uh, 1 divides everything. Uh, next, our primes. And we have something like this. This is 4, this is 6, this is 9 here, this is 12, and so on. And we sort of bound it off by, by 0. Okay. So, I'll give you a moment to discuss with your neighbors, but um, here again we see that meet and join are, are familiar friends. They're well-known concepts that you would have known about for years now. Uh, I'll give you like three minutes, maybe talk with your neighbors about what's been happening and come back with an answer to this question. <laughs> Yeah. I think I I think I've seen this one. Like the greatest Like Yeah. 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 Time. Right, so they, you basically have like you know, yeah. three yeah. 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 I mean, this is great. I'm just saying, yeah, but yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 So for that one, I guess it's valid order because it satisfies those two hours. One, so it's X divides Y, and Y divides Z, right? Right. So, like, so you can still ask, does that make sense? Does that make sense? This kind of weird order. Will you just say post Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's great. And so also in that so the next one is all the so if we have two numbers, that's a the the greatest A lot of people just want to get So now we Let's put that on the So we want to go to the next thing. No, both of them are So now, so then, I think I may have heard you guys. There's two and three, but go on this. 
right. I do. So that's been sort of a... Uh, okay. I think there's a lot of other interesting structures. Like the other thing you have. Uh, like, what do you get for the rate, though? It's a good question. And so, like, the big shots of those guys. Okay, how are we doing? Categories would be ideal. Well, that's it. Okay, I'm going to bring this back. Who? Any, any answers? Anyone want to shout out what uh, the meat in this post set is? Sorry. Yeah, we thought it was GCD and LCM. Yeah. So, which one's which? I guess yeah, the, the greatest one. lower bound is going to be the greatest common divisor, and uh, the least upper bound is going to be the least common multiple. Right? So, something bounds a set if it's a multiple of everything in that set. Above, bounds above. Um, okay, cool. Any other comments or questions that came out of that? Is there a word for sort of the depth in this diagram um, of an element? Um, a meaning? I guess there may be words in a particular place, but it's not something people think, think about in the abstract, um, in particular applications, yes. Oh, I was just simply they like in combinatorial geometry when it speaks of like the rank of an element. Right. But yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, so another good question I got was uh, whether meets always exist and whether multiple meets can exist. Mm -hmm. So let me make some remarks on that. Um, so remark one. Uh, meets or joins may not exist. Okay. And they can fail for two reasons. Uh, the first is condition 1 and A, and the second is condition B. Right? So, <coughs> so a set may not have a meet if it doesn't have uh, a lower bound. Um, so one example is if we take if we take this sort of example of the integers, or the natural numbers, which looks like this, um, approximately. And then we take, say, the set of all evens, and it, it continues up. Right? Then if we ask for uh, a join of this, a greatest, sorry, at least upper bound, this set has no upper bound, right? It goes, maybe I should write the actual numbers in, 0, 1, 2, Three, four. Right. So, so the meet of the meet of so two. I call it two n inside n does not exist. The join. Sorry, the join. Thanks. Another reason that a meet or join may not exist is that uh, there might be multiple lower bounds, not none of which is. Or R bounds, none of which is the greatest. So, in this particular case, so here's a, a house of diagram. So, this poster has four elements, and then the elements down here are less than the elements up here. Right, so, let's see how much to think about. Let's think about this set and think about whether a meter that exists. <laughs> well, this element is a lower bound of this, this set, and this element is also a lower bound but neither is, is comparable to the other. So neither is a, a greatest lower bound. So similarly, um, join does not exist. Um, thirdly, a second remark is um, there may be more than one need. So there was a discussion yesterday about the difference between partitions and surjections, uh, and you can view them as, as very, very similar structures, but with, with surjections, there are many surjections that witnessed each partition. Uh, and because all of them are equivalent, all of those different surjections, so that is any map from this four element set to one element set, is, can be considered a join of, of this pair here. Uh, to sort of reduce that to its essence, 
you might consider this poset here, which has two elements, um, and they're both less than or each other. So it's the total relation here. So if I look for the join of any set up here, right, maybe this one. So this is a, this is a lower bound of itself. Um, and it's in fact greater than every other, sorry, greater than every other lower bound. But so is this one. So they're both meets of, of this set here. Um, so this sort of hints at, at a theme that will come up more as we shift the categories proper. Uh, but that category theory really only sees things up to what is known as isomorphism. And these two points are essentially equivalent or, or in the terminology, isomorphic. Uh, so how, do we, how might we understand that here? Well, if we call this A and B, and you might imagine this as being part of a, a bit larger poset, but you just have two elements that are less than equal to each other. Um, there's, so it's a fact in any, any sorry, pre-order that if A is less than B and B is less than A, then uh, for all other elements of that poset, um, A is less than P if and only if B is less than P. Um, and similarly, uh, P is less than A if and only if B, P is less than B. So, uh, all that to say, uh, somehow if you have an element that are both less than or equal to each other, then as far as the rest of the post set is concerned, they look the same. And, and that's sort of this notion of isomorphism and this notion uh, that, that we sort of work without seeing in some sense. Um, which is why I've been saying A meet rather than, sorry, rather, sometimes we say B meet or something rather than A meet or something. Okay. One last philosophical remark before moving on. Uh, this, this is our first instance of what is known as a universal property. So it's universal in the sense, it, or, or universal object, maybe. It's an object that has a universal property. So the universe or re refers to this quantifier here that says it's sort of the greatest thing of some sort, or the least thing of some sort. And we'll see, um, so we see here throughout these examples, many familiar things can be characterized by this quite simple universal property, whether it's sort of and and or, or intersection and, and union, or greatest common divisor and least common multiple. And we'll see, it's a theme for our category theory that a lot of natural constructions, are, or constructions that seem obvious or natural, are natural because they have some characterizing universal property. Um, so one of the themes of this course is, is one of the themes of this course is that this idea that things can be characterized in terms of universal properties uh, applies not only within mathematics but also through um, more concrete applications. Okay. So section two, I'm going to talk about maps. So in this definition of POSET, we see, or in this example of a POSET, we see a bunch of elements and then some sort of web of relationships. Uh, between them, and this characterizes the structure called a uh, pre-order or preset. Um, and, and this is sort of another theme of category theory that you should look at, at objects that you want to study with respect to its relationship with other similar objects or other objects of the same class. So, in particular, we're studying this, this idea of a pre-order, and pre-orders come with a notion of relationship between pre-order called a monotone map. So. Here's a definition. Um, the monotone map, which I'll call F, from one pre order to another, is a function, so which we defined yesterday, as a, which is a, being a rule that takes 
if you give me a p, then I can give you a q. Um, it's a function such that um, if say p is less than p prime of p, then this order is preserved. So f of p is less than f of p prime in q. Okay, so let me give some examples of this. species and we have things like, I don't know, the, um, is it the other oh, way? Sorry? Is it the other way? It doesn't matter which order you oh, use, okay. right? Yeah, okay. Okay. In fact, let me write down the, the classes first. So it has the, and I won't pretend to have memorized this. King, empire, and class. I'm going the wrong way, right? Go backwards. <laughs> yeah. Species. Uh, genus, genus, family, family, uh, order, can't do order class, phylum, kingdom. <coughs> right. And so we have, you have sort of, this is a big thing here, I'll only draw a very small part of it, but um, I don't know, you might have some guy in here, tiger. So there is a map from this sort of big tree of life that says that <coughs> this, these things are species, um, these are probably families, I think. Genus. No, genus. Um, <laughs> the, sorry? Sapiens and Homo are reversed. This isn't really your subject, is it? No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> there we are. But, but the point being, there's two pre-orders, and there's a map between them that, given some sort of classification, you can give it, or, or given some, I don't know, what do you call these things? Thing, Taxa. you give it a start. What? Taxa. Taxa? Yeah, maybe. No, it's not my subject. Um, there's a, there's a, a function between uh, preserves the order. That's what we really want to witness. Um, uh, uh, a more mathematical example is something like cardinality. So, uh, if we have, we have this pre-order uh, called the power set with inclusion. Um, we also had this pre-order, the natural numbers for the usual ordering. And given some set, um, A subset X, you can map, you can count the number of elements in X. So I'm just going to call that A. So for example, if we have the set box times, this gets mapped to 2. Um, so that's a, that's a monotone math that people use all the time. Another monotone map uh, comes from this contagion. Well, right. so we saw uh, we have this first set of partitions of these four individuals. Um, and I want to map to the booleans to true-false that 
basically asks, um, are the coworker and the friend connected? So let's call this map thing. Um, so for example, we have this one, which is friend. So this was day. Um, and during the day, uh, people are at work and the kids are at home. So this maps to false because these two things are not part of the same connected component. Um, there's this other thing. This is called night. And this also maps to false. Uh, and something that maps to true would be the total partition. Right? In this one. The kid, uh, the coworker, and the friend are in the same connected component. So this maps to true. So I have to go here. The definition that would be relevant for the rest of this lecture and beyond is that um, the monotone map F preserves, let's just say joins, so that's the term, preserves joins, if for all, let's say P prime and P prime is equal to f of p join f of p prime. Okay. So um, question uh, is is that map the monotone? I told you yes, but maybe you should argue it. And two, um, does it preserve joins? I'll give you maybe two minutes to think about that. Sorry? Ah, Phi asked the question, um, are C and F in the same connected component? So there's these two, two individuals here, C and F, uh, and it maps to true if they are and false if they're not. Oh, sorry. That was bad. Yeah, sorry. You're right. So for all subsets of P, I want to say that F of the join of A is equal to the join of uh, F of A, where that notation I haven't defined, but it's just four elements of the form uh, Okay. Does any, do people want to? How are people doing in terms of this question? Does anyone doubt its correctness in terms of formulation? Okay, I want to keep moving. Um, so, so this this question about whether phi is monotone 
An informal answer basically says that the, the order um, on, on, the, on partitions says that one partition is less than another if it sort of is, is coarser. If, it, if every blob here, so for example, uh, well, this, this one here is coarser than this one here. Right. Um, and so it's monotone because if two things are in the same component in something lesser, because the blobs only grow in size, they're going to be in the same thing as, as you get larger in the sort of border there. Uh, in terms of whether it preserves joins, we can use, in fact, this example here that's already on the board. So, uh, so phi of this is false, and phi of this is false, but phi of this is true. Right? So, in particular, um, if we take, so answer, uh, phi does not preserve joins. Because um, phi of day join phi of night is equal to false join false, which is equal to false. Um, but phi of day join night is equal to true. Right? And so these things, two things are not equal. So an important fact, then, is that monotone maps, even though they preserve some structure, the order, do not have to preserve these, these universal properties. And in fact, uh, this is the generative effect idea that is referred to in the, the title of these two lectures and is, is developed further in the book and the further reading in this, this thesis of Eli Adams. Um, but the point being that from, if you look at different sort of views of these individual systems, you see that somehow the, the co-worker and the friend are separated. But when you look at what happens when you combine these systems, you find that this, this sort of separation uh, fails now. That the information here is not just simply the join of the information here and the information here. Right. And so this is something that's worth studying uh, in much more complicated situations, and this sort of language gives you a handle on that. OK. This. That's a smooth and tie of a Gawa connection. Um, which is a so a Gawa connection is also termed an adjunction, but that's a more general categorical term. And it's it's sort of the second view that we're gonna have after meets and joins, which correspond to limits and co-limits of of universal properties or universal constructions in, in category theory. Okay, so uh, three is the connections. So a Gala connection, this is the definition. Gala connection is sort of a pair of posets, P and Q, and morphisms, so monotone maps, F and G. Um, and I'm going to write. That, that's just notation um, to denote this sort of structure here, these four, two uh, posets, and, uh, two preorders and two monotone maps form a Galois connection. Um, so it's this thing where P and Q preorders of G monotone um, such that if between them that the same multiple 
multiplication by three. Okay, so what does it do? This, this thing here, if we take the integer of five, amounts it to 15. Now, this thing happens to have both left and right eye joints. Let's just focus on the left eye joint. Um, and the left eye joint happens to be something that sort of appears kind of weird mathematically, but is, well, is familiar to us. This is the right eye joint, right? This is, the, yes, sorry. This, is a, this arrow goes in the direction of the left eye joint, so I'm telling you about the right eye joint. Well, I could tell you about the right, left eye joint. Um, so the, the left eye joint is the floor of the, the number divided by three. So what does this mean? Uh, it means we take some number, so let's take 3.3, .3, we divide it by 3, kind of cheat there, and then we take the, the integer that's the greatest integer less than it. So this maps to 1. Okay, so these two things are adjoint. Um, what does this adjoint condition mean here? This means that um, if we have some integer m, and some real number x, then 3n is less than x if and only if the, uh, if and only if n is less than the greatest integer less than x divided by 3. So this notion of a junction or, or Galois connection characterizes this notion of a, a floor function. Similarly, this, so the 3 here is, is sort of a parameter, it doesn't matter which, which integer we chose. Uh, so if I choose 1 here, then there's an inclusion that maps the integers and distributes them as real numbers. And the floor of that, a real number, is the, the right adjoint to that. In fact, the ceiling is the left adjoint. Okay. As a second example, we can think about uh, exists and for all. So. function, if we have two sets, x and y, and a function between them, then we get, in fact, two Galois connections um, between the power set of x and the power set of y, which are the post sets we, we saw earlier. So I'll give them names first, and then tell you what they are. So we have f upper star, we have going from, from P, the power set of y to the power set of x, and then in reverse we've got f lower shriek, it's called, and then f lower star. And if you want to know which way the junctions go. So I should have said, I guess I never wrote this down, but I will, just to be explicit, we call f, so a Galois connection consists of two maps, we call one of them the left eye joint and the other the right eye joint, and in particular we call f the left eye joint and g the right eye joint. But, so, so to give you some definitions of these maps, there's an obvious map that takes a subset of, of y and gives you a subset of x. Um, and this map is called yeah, upper star, uh, but it's also just commonly written as f inverse. So it takes a subset b or y um, and returns the elements of a in x such that f of a exists in y. B. Sorry, right, thanks. Um, we also have f lower shriek is known as the direct image, um, and so this is the, the set of y and y such that there exists uh, a and a such that f of a is y. And this is down here. And your arrow goes wrong. The arrow goes the wrong way on the. Thanks. The flow star of A is equal to Y and Y, such that for all um, A in X, uh, such that 
f of a equals y, we have a and a. Okay. It would help to see an example of this because um, it really clarifies these notions. But I'm going to skip that. But you can ask me in the half hour after class or anytime really. Uh, but what I wanted to point out is that these quantifiers here exist and for all appear as adjunctions to this inverse image map. And uh, this is an extremely important fact in logic. But again, we see, and we'll, we'll see more of this throughout the course, particularly in the last two lectures. Um, but, but what I want to emphasize again is that we have this abstract notion of some sort of universal construction, and we see familiar important structures falling about just from applying them to the sum notion of order and monotone map. Um, other cases you see this, uh, the, the name Galois connection comes from Galois theory, which is sort of based on this particular Galois connection between this notion of field extension and, and subgroup, um, which you might see if you're a math major. Um, and it was sort of extremely important in solving sort of millennial problems about the insolubility of the quintic and trisecting angles and things like that. Uh, there's, a, there's a cool Galois connection between these things called relational clones, or basically between some relational picture and some functional picture in, in CSPs and things like 3SAT, which allows you to, to talk about certain uh, hardness conjectures about, about solvability problems, which is really cool. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the problem set, you'll see uh, a, a cute little example about sort of pragmatics. So uh, there's this notion, if I ask, say, uh, or, or someone asks, did you enjoy this lecture? Um, and, and someone responds, I enjoyed the first half. You might, you have a particular um, understanding of the semantics of that, that is, literally, you enjoyed the first half and who knows about the second half. But you might reasonably infer that the person didn't enjoy the second half. And this is a sort of computation that we do all the time that is uh, kind of captured in this notion of, of Galois connection. And you'll see if you do the PSET. Um, but in one last minute, I want to bring this notion of Galois connection back to this notion of uh, preserving joins and, and this idea of generative effects. And if they just say they're a really, uh, the sort of pre order version of a really important theorem in category theory. Um, so this is called the adjoint functional theorem for four sets. Well, pre orders. And it says that uh, a monotone map F is a left adjoint if and only if it preserves joins. This notion of, of Galois connection, or whether this idea about whether you can find some sort of left adjoint or right adjoint to a given map, allows you to, to argue things about whether your, your particular map, which you might uh, think about in, in, say, in this particular case, as a view on an object, um, so you have some system and a simplified view of it, uh, has the possibility to throw up unexpected information, so uh, generative effects. Anyway, so thanks for coming. Um, stick around to chat if you like it. <laughs>